uh, the the uh, just we, so we're on the same page. Inshallah, next halakha. Inshallah. Uh, so it's Surah 90 and Balad. Um, uh, yeah, it's in Balad, the land. <coughs> That's the Surah we'll, inshallah we'll, we'll do. And on that note, the next halakha is uh, Saturday, January 11th of 2020. <coughs> if, if, Allah, uh, if Allah gives us another thousand years, inshallah we'll get to the top <laughs> 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 So how many people have questions? Maybe I, I do just because this, a lot of people around the world see the, these recordings. I just want to say, just go on the record, that one of, you know, some, some people write me and say, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's sad, that we, we, we're, we're very far away, uh, um, how can we, how can we contribute to what you're doing and, and so on. And one of the biggest things that you can do, whether in my lifetime or after I'm gone, if I'm gone, then if I'm conscious, I'll be doing the art for you. <laughs> if I have consciousness, it is to take these commentaries and to work on them and distill them into an actual written accessible published text yeah. I, I, I you know I have to write things about Islamic law I, I have my my next thing you know, I, I'm writing about hadith and women I'm not going to have the time to ever write any systematic study of the Quran I just I we, we what time do we go to bed every day? Four, five, Four and five in the morning, and we still don't have enough time. I mean, there's just not enough time. I sleep three, four hours, and there's just not enough time. So, if you if you want to contribute and you have the intellectual capacity, <clears throat> study these tafsir and take the theology, extract the theology, and mm -hmm. transform it into a written text that Muslims can benefit from. Because these moral lessons, earlier generations wrote volumes upon volumes upon volumes about these points, and modern Muslims are impoverished because they don't have access to these volumes. So that's just simply. That would be an honor. The, the, the honor would be mine for, for anyone to actually do it justice. <coughs> Okay, quite, you heard about, talk more on that. I'm not wearing my eyeglasses. Okay. So, so just to. What well, you you is, so we're working on the you're working on the khutbas right now. Yeah, we have someone who's going to be working on publishing the khutbas. The yeah. So the tafsir is a harder project. It's a harder project, but if anybody is interested, let me know because we can start on that too. So um, anyway, okay. So Q and A's. Let's. Um, I'm not wearing my take... glasses, so I can't see anyone. Yeah. So I don't want to call people. So I, I wanted to just take a, several questions at a time and then request for answer. So let's start over here. If you want to just like tell, we'll take like two questions at a time. Go ahead. Um. Um. With the um, uh, with the last portion about the reference, what I have or Baha whether it is a reference to Thamud or the Ashqah or God. Um, as you were speaking, I thought about something and I wanted to get your opinion of it, is that I favored it to be God for uh, two reasons. One is in the previous ayahs, every reference to Thamud, they were in the plural. And then when it comes to Yachaf, just one person, so that makes it either Ashqaha or God. And the other uh, thing uh, in my analysis that made me favor God is that um, the reference is, is in the Fi'l Mubarak, what I have Uqbaha, which is always when it's reference to God, it's not a past uh, verb. What, 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 how, what would you think? That's actually a really good point. The, the first point about the, the reference to the, in the singular, 
some of the commentators said, well, this, it refers to the singular because it refers to what they would used to call Heimer Thamud. Heimer Thamud is, is it's a derogatory reference to the, the individual who challenged um, uh, Nabi Salah al -Salam. Um, but I, I actually, I agree with you that it is probably a reference to God because of the Fa'lu Mudara, the continuing verb. Because it, it could have said, وَلَمْ يَخَفْ عَقُبَاهَ It didn't fear the consequences. Um, or even عَقِبَتُهَا Possibly. But وَلَا يَخَفْ عَقُبَاهَ It's consistent with the Quranic consistent theme that if Allah would have willed, Allah would, would create an entire new species. Human beings, you know, you don't really own this earth. How many times does the Quran inform human beings that you don't think that you are the only people in the universe? There are, there are, you, you are just a part of what Allah has created in this cosmos, and don't think that Allah is not capable of creating an entirely different thing altogether. And it's consistent with the way. God disciplines the ego. Understand you're very valuable. You're very valuable in the eye of God because you are the creation of God. But at the same time, discipline that, that realization with the reality of your place in the cosmos. And especially that Samud, it was even more cruel and inequitous than Quraysh. I mean, from what we know from all their lore, some of the most cruel stories there. And it's all very materialistic. It would be very fitting to remind Quraysh of a people that are similar to them, but an even more extreme example. And for God to say, you know, if, if you don't, if you're not careful, your fate could be as, as miserable. So I, I agree with you. I think that's a really good point, especially the other fan. Sorry, we'll Come on. But... Yeah, uh, just that's actually a, a follow up on the on the same notion. Um, considering the there's an ayah in the in the Quran, Surah Zumar, "Ladini yastami'un al-qawl, fatabi'un al-ahsanu." I wanted to hear your perspective on the idea that um, and maybe the, the scholars of the past have talked about this as well that these ayat not only that they have a specific meaning and that others are just you know they may fall short that's forgiven but that the ayat may have may carry each of those meanings oh, yeah. acceptably um, and that at times maybe the, the, the importance of one meaning changes versus the other and I felt like that last ayah was a a good opportunity to understand that. Yeah, Surah Zumar, the, the, just so everyone follows, the, the A um, reference was... Um, A39. Yeah, yeah that... Uh, uh, m m describing those who are truly faithful, one of their attributes, one of their characteristics, is their ability to evaluate goodness and to follow the best of the good. So th that's what the reference is. Um, but uh, not only do I agree with you, and actually it is part of the methodology of tafsir that we refer to layers of meaning. And I've, I've done that with consistently throughout. But even beyond layers, the Quran is addressed to addressed specific situations with a, a language that addresses all contexts. And it is up to the human interpreter to, to understand the, be, because we believe that this is Allah's language, the, the, this is God's language, then we also believe 
that <coughs> the phrasing is very intentional. And because the phrasing is very intentional, then it is absolutely acceptable and not, in fact, imperative that a verse that meant one thing in a certain historical period can be uh, reinter. And one of the examples that we, the the um, in the khutbah that I gave about uh, um, the ayat addressing al Abd al Abiq, the the uh, um, a slave. In the context, in 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 the past. I don't know if you've heard this khutbah, but if you refer back to it. Basically, that these same verses, if read uh, within a modern epistemology, they would be an unequivocal condemnation of slavery. It, it doesn't really matter to me that past commentators, within their epistemological context, within their, their historical circumstance, didn't understand this language to be an unequivocal condemnation of slavery. Because I can read these verses today and see in them an unequivocal condemnation of slavery. And, and we actually see this with Surah Al-Balad. When, when Surah, in, in Surah Al-Balad says, when in the past, some comic, Quranic commentators understood that this, this, the surah is talking about that if you want to pass through the gateway, the gateway of divinity and heaven, free a slave. But they saw this as not an absolute moral imperative. They saw this as um, ultimately voluntary act, like prayer. If you want to pray, pray, and you elevate through the gate by praying, or like fasting. If you don't, well, except that if you don't free the slave, for in, in their view, you don't incur sin. It's just that if you want a higher status with God, you free the slave. In reading it within the modern epistemology, I can see in Surah Al-Balad, in fact, a, an empowerment to outlaw or to create the moral ethic to outlaw slavery. Why not? And I think Muslims cheat the Quran when they are only limited, it's critical to study the tradition. But that's just the beginning. If, if all you do, and this is what goes back to what Grace was talking about in Islamic conferences, if all you do is regurgitate what you found in the tradition, then we're stuck in the 9th century or the 10th century. You know, I, I like... I'd like to think of it this way, um, an expectation within academic settings for tenure. I mean, at least if, it's the, if the process works the way it's supposed to work, is that you must make an original contribution. Even if you've published a ton of stuff, but you didn't make an original contribution, you're not supposed to get tenure. Technically, you're not even supposed to get your doctorate, although you know, n not not everyone stick to that rules. A lot of people do get doctors without doing something very original or original. But anyway, it's so technically, you're not supposed to get a doctorate unless you contribute something original. You're not supposed to get tenure unless you contribute something original. Originality. The same standard should apply to Muslims for Quranic studies. Why should I sit and listen to you? Unless, if you're just going to regurgitate the past, mm. You haven't earned my time, you haven't earned my respect, you haven't earned deference, you haven't earned anything. Originality should be what we demand of our teachers, our scholars, our imams. Offer me new something 
in you spirit, in you thought, in you analysis, in, in you thing or another, because the book of God can can offer that. It's the interpreter that is deficient, not the book. So I think this may be a mundane question, but based on what you just said, maybe not. Um, what is the significance of the mood being sent to she camel? Because I remember when I first encountered the Quran, I was like, well, first, what is a she camel? Because, right, <laughs> I didn't know what that was. But <clears throat> I guess as I started to learn, I became more aware of how dependent the Arabs were on camels. And I'm assuming, I don't know if she camels give milk or whatever, I'm not sure. Yeah. But I guess, like, <clears throat> I'm wondering, with our Usuli method, do we say then that maybe the she camel is representative of, I guess, of something that would be of substantive value in any sort of particular social historical context that they just said, screw it, we're just going to kill it just because? So, like, what would be like a modern sort of, I guess it's a two prong question, like the significance of the she camel, and then I guess for us, what would be like the modern equivalent of, I guess, a she camel that we probably shouldn't just throw away? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I was, I, I, I've, uh, yesterday I was thinking of the modern, trying to think of a modern equivalent. Yeah. Uh, she can, why the she camel, the, the she camel is often three times or four times the price of a male camel. And part of, um, uh, and uh, um, she camels, you do you do milk them, um, and part of what Samud was told was also that they they can't touch the milk of. Uh, um, so they couldn't exploit. Uh, they so couldn't mean, exploit yeah. the the the, she, the the camel or the camel's offspring. There are in the by in the in the the lore that you read, there are some stories about the color of the scam. It's not that's not important. I mean but, but apparently the the color or the hide of the scamel was very unusual. And um there is in some of the narratives they tell the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh that hide would fetch a great price on the market because it's very unusual tan and for Arabs back then it would, and he told them God's command is that you can't touch it you haven't it's none of your business what the you know it doesn't matter what type of price it would fetch so part of the challenge to Samud is uh, is that they couldn't make a buck off this camel and had to respect the boundaries of that camel and allow it to pasture, uh, allow an animal to pasture that, that he can't profit from. Yeah. Uh, now, I, the way I've always read the story of Samud is a lesson in humanity. I mean, and, I, that, and that's, uh, is that original? Yes, because you don't find it in the tradition. That you you don't find in the tradition someone that says, well, you learn from this that you respect the rights of animals. But within my modern context, I learned from the story of the Samud a lesson about the rights of animals. Mm. What the tradition does say is that they condemn Samud's cruelty with animals. That's clearly there. But beyond cruelty, even just respecting the, the, the animals have a right not to be harmed, not to be molested, not to be restricted, not to be imprisoned. So from this, I can condemn the way we treat cattle. And the, the way we, you know, the, the, every, we don't allow cattle to in, in pastures anymore. I mean, the, the, the way we treat livestock is just criminal. It, it's a huge sin. And contributing to that industry I'm becoming more and more fanatic about this. I mean, I, I haven't issued a fatwa yet, but I'm I'm trying to resist my, I'm fighting with myself, because I feel the urge to issue a fatwa saying it's haram to buy any meat that's not allowed to pasture, but I know the the consequences of a fatwa like this, and so I keep praying on it and praying on it and praying on it and praying on it. 
but if I if I get fed up and issue it, know that Samud is partly responsible. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that's one thing. The, the other thing is that just the, the the hedonistic love of materiality of Samud. Mm. The, the, the fact that everything translated ultimately into a buck, I mean, into a dirham or whatever the, the currency was. And the absolutely, even the mountainscapes, even nature, it either has to be turned into homes or uh, burial sites. They wouldn't leave anything. You know that one of the things that uh, there, this is archaeologically supported. In that area, the area of Hajj, there there is a dam that is very old. It, it's been dated to before AD. So some we're not sh quite sure how whether it goes back as old as fourth century B BC, but some archaeologists said. 300 BC, some archaeologists said, no, it's around 200 BC. Anyway, and that dam in Saudi Arabia, it's clear that there was a river that passed through. The dam, part of it has, has uh, fallen, but most of it is actually still completely intact. It's an amazing sight. But whatever water source, whatever river pa used to pass there had completely dried. It, you can see, you know, you can see the water, the, the riverbed, but it's gone. And when I think back of in the good old days when when I was able to visit Saudi and uh, go to these places, when I think back, this is exactly what if we continue treating nature the way Samu treated nature, this is exactly where we're going to end up. And so the modern understanding of the story of Samut is Basically extremely pertinent. Anti-commodification yeah. of natural resources. Yeah. Climate change. Mm. And Greece is a fanatic about climate change, so and climate change. I wanted to, uh, the same thing with, with the camel. Um, I'm curious, Sheikh, one, one thing I struggle with is the seeming um, anthrop uh, anthropocentricity, the human-centeredness of the way God speaks to us in the Quran, or at least the way that Muslims interpret to God to be speaking to us. And I'm really curious about this story. Um, with the camel and I mean I think there's 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 a good amount of stuff out there of Muslims kind of reclaiming and I don't mean to be impolite because a lot of good work has been put into this I feel but kind of in, in, in a very kind of liberal floofy woofy way okay you know there's a surah that's named after a bee mm. there's a surah on the tree you know there's we should be nice and not cruel like Sheikh mm. was saying and also the, the brother here but I'm, what I'm curious is, given this, this text and the potential of this story, what kind of pretext, you know, what kind of, what kind of way can we change our logic in approaching this to really investigate, is Allah really speaking to us in a human-centered way? You know, and how much agency is Allah giving to animals? So it's not just us, you know, being stewards. It's not just us, but it's us actually really having to respect animals and non-humans in their own way, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, of course, it, but it's not, we, we, most Muslims grow up learning that the tree and a leaf and an ant and every thing supplicates the name of the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I saw something recently uh, it was something that, um, I'm, I'm not remembering it, but it was something that, that it made me remember this this whole uh, the, the, every living thing supplicates the Lord 
that 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 leaf or something like that when you when when you come close to it to to pluck it, yeah. it it's what was it? I, when I you know, cut a plant, it makes an ultrasonic sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like a like yeah. a cr ultrasonic cry, you know. So it it, it, it reminded me a lot of of the the subculture. And, mm. you know, I remember you, when I'm growing up, one of the things that my teachers would always say, uh, you can't, if, uh, if you kill an ant, even if you kill a fly, uh, God comes in the final day and asks you, did you, was this necessary? So we were taught that even when we found, uh, like, a, 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 an insect aside, we would carry it to the outside and open the window and let it out. You can't just kill. Um, I remember as a kid, one of the times I got beaten up was because in school, I saw a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, 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 impolite kids, you know, the, these troublemakers, and they were going around stomping on ants. And I went to them and said, Allah is go you're going to go to hell because you're killing ants. <laughs> And so they left the ants and you know me. Um, and, I, and I was asthmatic and very weak, so you know. You know. And so it's definitely, and all of us learn, grow up learning you know, about you know the the woman who went to hell because she killed a cat, the man who uh, Allah forgave all his sins because he saved the dog. The, the the prophet marching with an army and then changing the course of the march to to not disturb a nest. I mean, only now what is the problem? Because I completely agree with you that yes, we have all these reports, but when you read modern Muslim <coughs> literature, it does sound apologetic. It does sound like, as you put it, foofy sort of you know. As if we 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 want to convince the other that we're nice people and to respect us, but you feel it's not an ideological imperative within. And I think then you have to put it within its larger universal context, because then I ask you, what part of our discourses? And when I say our, I mean people who are ethnically, the, constitute the majority of Muslim groups, Persians, Arabs, Indonesians, Malaysians, and so on, what part of our discourses, in what field, does it in fact, is it a serious ideological engagement rather than an apologetic enterprise? I mean, we talk about human rights, it's the same, democracy, it's the same, econ economics, it's the same, banking, it's the same. So what is the problem? In my view, the problem is the lack of political autonomy. In other words, a, a people who do not believe they control their own fate, but constantly think that the perception of the other is the most critical thing for them. So how the other understands us is far important than how we really are. All of our discourses since colonialism has been like that. I mean, that sense of confidence and sense of, and it's only among some Muslims in the West who get the, you know, who break the, the colonial complex. They, they finally say, oh, I'm not interested in what, you know, this Orientalist thinks, or I'm not interested in what this white guy or white person thinks of me. I, I, I want to, I, I am fed up. I want to engage my tradition in a serious, systematic, uh, you know, and people like Fazl rahman or Muhammad Ghabal or, you know, come to mind, but they're <clears> not <throat> a critical mass. And I, and I really think as long as, as long as Muslims in the West continue to think of them themselves as an extension of the immigrant phenomena rather than a native phenomena, they're not going to create the independent institutions that allow for that type of serious engagement. Where you talk about animal rights and environmental rights, not because you care about what Christians and Jews think of you, but because you want, you want 
an, an Islamic, serious Islamic ethic uh, that directly, normatively affects the way we deal with animal rights and environmental rights. So that's as to Muslims in the West. As to Muslims in the in the East. I, I mean, I hate to sound dogmatic, but the, the cure is democracy. I mean, despotism, authoritarianism kills the soul. There, there is no academia and there is no law in under despotism. Law is a fiction. The rule of law is a fiction. And academia is a fiction. Because what the first thing you learn as an academic when you, when you grow up in an authoritarian context is either if you have an honest discourse that it is entirely marginal, because unless it, it somehow benefits authority, then it's marginal to reality. Or you shape your discourse, and especially something like about rights, to basically ultimately serve those in power in an authoritarian despotic context. So if I'm living in Egypt, <coughs> What I say about the environment or what I say about animal rights, what immediately the government is interested because is it going to affect our ability to explore our, to, to exploit our natural resources? Is it if going to affect our ability to give contracts to French companies and British companies that come in and bury nuclear waste in, in, in natural habitats? And if I don't shape my academic discourse in a way not to interfere with the, the government's material interests, then I'm as good as dead. And nothing works under this despite. So since colonialism, we have not been serious about anything. And the, the sooner Muslims confront this reality, I think the sooner we start maybe breathing some fresh air and at least being honest with ourselves.